question. Translation is the blank step, and it should be first or second, of protein synthesis and occurs in the blank. So is it first or second? I kind of just said it. Yep, it's obviously second. Transcription is first. Can I navigate this without looking at the screen? And where does protein synthesis occur? Where do we make proteins in the cell? Yeah, ribosomes are the organelle, and I'm getting these answers from Janelle, FYI. Ribosomes are the organelles where we make proteins. Okay. So a sequence of DNA reads as follows. AAT, <clears throat> CAG, GTC. Which amino acids would be produced from the sequence? Now, be careful because we've been given a sequence of DNA. <clears throat> so first of all, we need to transcribe this DNA. If we transcribe it, what do we end up with? What's the mRNA that we get if we transcribe this? Okay, we've got to be careful. Okay, so what you did, Michelle, is you just, you literally just switched out the T's and the U's. But this, the process tells us that we've got to transcribe every single base. So, and I keep calling, I'm sorry, Abigail, you've got to, you've got to transcribe every single base. So the A gets transcribed to a U. That second A is transcribed to a U. The T is transcribed to an A so on and so forth. So yes, it looks like both C C A G. Yeah, both Melissa and Janelle are correct. So good job. So I, I, I can see your logic, Abigail. I can see why you would do that, um, partially because of how I've explained it over the last week. But we've got to transcribe everything. It's not just a matter of just switching the T's and the U's. All right, so now that we've gone through this process of transcription, we can use the codon chart to translate the mRNA into amino acids. <clears throat> so we've got UUA as our first codon. What does that get translated to? Good, thank you, Melissa. That's translated to L-E-U. If we're looking at the first base, the first base is U. That means we're looking in the first row, the very top row. The second base is also U, so we should be looking in the very first column, the, the leftmost column. And then our last base is A. So within that very first cell in the top left, we should be looking at the third amino acid, which is LEU. Now, one thing I need to mention, and I forgot to mention it yesterday, actually, okay. Um, I'm gonna publish a codon chart on Canvas, and it will just be a link to a codon chart that you all can bookmark in your Google Chrome, um, so you'll have easier access to it. So I apologize to those of you at home who, who don't have access to a, a codon chart right now. Um, okay, the second codon was GUC. What is that translated to? Yeah, so G is our first base. So we're looking in the bottom row. U is our second base yet again. So we're looking in that very first column on the, on the far left. And the only option for amino acids down there is VAL, valine. And then lastly, our third codon as told by Janelle and Melissa is C A G. Is that what is that translated to? Good. G L N. That's glutamine. So C is our second row. We're looking in the second row. Then A is the second base. So we're looking in the third column. And G is our last base. So we're looking at glutamine there. G L N. So for those of you who prefer the other codon chart, the circular one. I'm sorry that we didn't provide that option for you here. Um, 
you will have that option if you have a code on or if you have a, a question like this on your test. You'll have both available to you. Question four, which of the following is responsible for bringing the correct amino acid to the ribosome to be added to a polypeptide chain? What type of uh, nucleic acid would that be? It's responsible for bringing the amino acid. Yeah, thank you, Abigail and Melissa. So remember that the T and tRNA stands for transfer. If you can remember what those little letters are, the M stands for messenger, the T stands for transport, the R stands for ribosomal. If you can remember what those, transfer, I'm sorry, I keep saying transport, but it's transfer RNA. If you can remember those little letters, then you're gonna have an easier time remembering what the differences are and what they actually do. So transfer RNA is literally going to transport amino acids from one place in the cell to the ribosome. Last question, which of the following is the correct order of protein synthesis? You should always kind of know what comes first. We always start with- DNA, mRNA, then protein and tray. Good, we always start with DNA because DNA is inside of the nucleus. We transcribe that DNA to mRNA. We translate that mRNA to a protein and the protein determines, or a group of proteins, will determine the traits. All right. Okay, so today is the fifth day of our fifth unit. Today might feel a little bit long, so uh, hopefully you all have stretched out your hands. I don't want to punish your hand muscles too much. The title of today's lesson is Cell Specialization. And today is Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. The objective of today's lesson is to explain how instructions in DNA lead to cell differentiation and results in cells specialized to perform specific functions in multicellular organisms. So we have a whole bunch of Asians going on here differentiation, cell specialization. We're gonna talk about gene regulation. So these are different processes which make our cells unique, which give them different functions. So at this point in the lesson, I'd love to see notebooks open and people ready to write so we can make sure we're taking good notes. It's always a good idea to just try to capture at the very least the title of the lesson as well as the date because then you can come back to it in your study process and know exactly what was covered and when it was covered. I know we had some folks absent yesterday. I am going to, oh no. Send you the link to our YouTube playlist where you will be able to find yesterday's class recording. <clears throat> All right, so I wanna mention something not directly related to biology, but we will start to relate it to biology uh, as this week and this month goes on. And that is that March is National Women's History Month. Hopefully you all have thought about this or you talked about it in some of your other classes. I apologize that I didn't mention it yesterday. And just a little bit of background about National Women's History Month. It began as Women's History Week in Santa Rosa, California in 1978. Um, if you've ever heard of wine country in California, this is wine country, Sonoma Valley. Uh, not related to Women's History Month. I just thought that was a fun fact. Uh, but originally it was celebrated to coincide with International Women's Day, which happens every year on March 8th. And this, this is to recognize and celebrate the contributions of women specifically to American society. 
it quickly in the following years spread to other communities across the country, such that two years later in February 1980, after being lobbied by several women's groups and, and historians, the then president, Jimmy Carter, issued a presidential proclamation declaring the week of March 8, 1980, National Women's History Week. Subsequently, seven years later, Congress passed a public law designating March as Women's History Month. Uh, every year, there is a theme assigned to National Women's History Month, and this year, the theme is Valiant Women of the Vote, Refusing to be Silenced. That might seem like somewhat of a, an odd theme, considering last year was the presidential election, uh, but the reason for this is that if you know anything about constitutional history or just American history in general, uh, then maybe you know that 1920 was the year that the 19th Amendment was ratified, which gave women the right to vote across the country. Prior to 1920, women could not vote here in the United States. JT, did you, were you gonna add something? Oh no, I unmuted on accident. I haven't even tried to use it so far, but the, the setup does feel different. No. Go ahead. Uh, I was not here when he finished it. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Where was I? Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, the 19th Amendment was ratified in 1920, giving women the right to vote here in the United States. So last year technically was the centennial celebration of that accomplishment. And we were going to celebrate as a country the 100th year anniversary. But because of COVID, which if you remember, almost exactly a year ago, kind of turned the country upside down, we were not able to uh, celebrate in the same way we would have. So uh, the women who organized this month every, every year have decided to push this theme into 2021. So. I just thought that would be interesting to mention. So this month, I'm going to try to bring up some different women who have inspired me, and then I'm, I'm going to gather some inspiration from you all as well. I know we've got some Frida Kahlo fans in this class, and Mae Jemison, and I don't remember the YouTuber's name. What's her name? Trisha Paytas. We can maybe learn about the history of YouTubers, or I don't know. We'll figure it out. Um, but Today, I started with someone who has been an inspiration to me. This person's name is Reverend Dr. Pauli Murray. Um, Dr. Pauli Murray was what I consider a Harlem Renaissance woman. Uh, if you know anything about the Renaissance movement, it was a 16th century Italian uh, movement in which typically wealthy men um, became really good at a lot of different things. They were musicians, they were artists, um, they were orators, they were debaters, they were whatever. They were just doing a whole bunch of stuff. And I, I think that Dr. Pauli Murray is the best example we have of a Harlem Renaissance person. The Harlem Renaissance took place in the 1920s in New York City, and it was a time in which Black people uh, really advanced and they became really great poets. There were a lot of strong writers. There were uh, musicians, jazz was being popularized. Uh, in New York City at the time. Uh, certain types of dance, swing dance, were bec becoming popularized. So it was a really active time and probably no one from that period uh, better represents the diversity of talent that came out of that place in that time than Dr. Pauli Murray. She was a poet, a writer, an activist, an organizer, a legal theorist, and a priest. So imagine doing all of that in one lifetime. She actually grew up in Durham, North Carolina, and, and you know, unfortunately, all too common, her story was one of pain growing up. Uh, she was orphaned when her mother died of a brain hemorrhage, and then her father, in his grief, he was committed to a hospital for the Negro insane, and where he was then beaten to death by um, a staff member at the hospital. 
And so Dr. Murray went on to describe that period in her life as absolutely foundational. And she said that that really determined and decided what her identity would be going forward. Um, obviously that was, you know, the, the hospital employee who killed her father was white and it was a racial incident. So from that point forward, she was really gonna dedicate herself um, to specific struggles. But she also had a, another unique struggle, one that I think is becoming more commonly talked about in 2021. Uh, which is a struggle with gender identity as well. And she changed her name eventually from Anne Pauline, which was her birth name, to Polly. And she was known to refer to herself using multiple pronouns in her writing. Today, uh, historians who study Dr. Murray will refer to her uh, using her, she, her, her pronouns, um, he, him, his pronouns, as well as they and them pronouns. So uh, in many ways, she was ahead of ahead of the curve when it when we think about kind of just gender expression at the time as well. Are you okay? <laughs> um, she graduated from Howard University with her Juris Doctorate, so she became a lawyer. Um, but interestingly enough, when she was applying to college before law school, she could not gain admission into the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill because of her race. Uh, she was a very, very strong high school student. And so she did ancestry research. As we can see in this picture, Dr. Murray was pretty light skinned. So she figured out that she probably had some white ancestors. Turns out she, that she was right. But not only that, her white ancestors were slave owners who had attended the University of North Carolina. And so she lobbied to the university saying, I've got ancestors who are alumni of this university. And so therefore, just like any other student who might be considered a legacy, meaning that they have a family member who attended, I should be granted admission. Uh, the school still declined to, to grant her admission on account of her race. So then she thought, she thought maybe I need to get out of the South. I'm going to go travel to, North, to New York. Uh, and I want to attend Columbia University, which is an Ivy League school in New York City, where she was not granted admission there, but this time on account of her gender, because Columbia University at the time did not accept women. So she then defined this struggle. You know, she was being discriminated against on the basis of both her race and her gender. And this came to really define her, her careers. Um, she ended up, like I said, graduating, getting her JD, her law degree. She ended up writing a seminal book called State's Laws on Race and Color. This book was at the foundation of a lot of the legal work that the NAACP did in the South as well as the American Civil Liberties Union, which is a uh, progressive legal movement in the United States. Um, but dissatisfied with what, with what her legal career was becoming at the height of the civil rights movement and dissatisfied by the fact that there weren't many women in leadership roles during the civil rights movement, she decided to pursue a career uh, as a clergy, as a member of the clergy. So she became the first African-American woman in the United States to be uh, an Episcopal priest. So that's really how she kind of finished her life. And she died in 1985, but she accomplished more than most people did. Um, and to make it relevant to you all, if it hasn't, if it isn't already relevant for a number of reasons, uh, she, even as a, as a law student at the age of, let's say, 24 or 25, uh, wrote an essay that eventually became the inspiration for Brown versus Board of Education. Um, so she wrote an essay that inspired Thurgood Marshall, who then argued uh, Brown versus Board of Education in front of the Supreme Court, and she was only 24, 25 years old. Of course, that was the Supreme Court decision that integrated schools throughout the United States. So uh, it's very possible that, you know, the reality of our school here at West Mech would be totally different if it weren't for the contributions of Dr. Murray. So. Uh, Hopefully you learned something. And like I said, in the future, I'm going to try to bring in people who you all have put me on to and we'll try to relate it to science in some way. But I just wanted to start off this discussion series with someone who is probably lesser known, but one of the more important activists in uh, recent American history. All right, back to the bio. So the central dogma of biology is here. We've talked about transcription. We've talked about translation. Today, we're gonna to move on and talk a little bit more about how proteins are made and how those proteins contribute to unique traits. But this is the central dogma. 
Uh, this is the answer we were looking for in that warm up, and it's about to come up again in a Kahoot. So please go to www.kahoot.it and enter the game code 963-9789. Should be 10 quick questions. I don't think any of them are particularly or extremely difficult. So I'd like to see us doing really well in this game. Let's see if the winner can have at least seven correct. Seven out of 10. Thank you, Sully. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Janelle. Thank you, Abigail. I'm also going to take this time as people are finishing up joining the game to remind you all that we are having the biology town hall today at three o'clock. Um, this is not only for you all, but for your families to get any questions answered that you may have as we approach next week's midterm exam. The midterm on, in this class will be on Monday. No, this is third, this is third block. Yeah. So the midterm in this class will be on Tuesday. Um, and also it could be questions just about like, your science course, you know, progress for next year, whatever. Um, so Dr. Potts will be there. He's the assistant principal and he's our uh, administrator in the science department. And then we'll have the other two biology teachers and myself to answer questions as well. So uh, I know it's kind of the, an inopportune time for some of you who may, whose parents may be busy, but uh, if you can join, then I would encourage you to do so. All right, good. We got 16 people, that's excellent. Which of the following is a type of RNA that brings the amino acids to the ribosome? I meant to shorten the amount of time. Okay, yeah, this is tRNA. Remember, if you can remember what those little letters stand for, you're probably in a better position to understand what they do. T stands for transfer. Transfer RNA is literally transferring amino acids from various places in the cell to the ribosome. Okay, good job. Excellent. I know we had seven people get it right, but Josue was the fastest, just a little bit faster than Abigail. Good job. Which of the following is the RNA? is the RNA that, that copies the DNA to bring the code to the ribosome. The type of RNA is what it should say. My apologies. Which of the following is the type of RNA that copies the DNA to bring the code to the ribosome? Good. So M, the M stands for messenger. It's going to carry the message from DNA to the ribosome. Which of the following is not part of a nucleotide?
Okay, <clears throat> so a lot of us said sugar, but uh, the five carbon sugar is a main part of the nucleotide. Uh, we did, I, I did ask you all to draw that out at some point last week, but perhaps we've forgotten. So the sugar and the phosphate make up the backbone of the nucleotide and the nitrogen base could be either adenine or thymine or cytosine or guanine or uracil. Polymerase is something else. It's an enzyme. Okay, good job. We've got a lot of movement at the top, so keep going, folks. Good job, Lance. Abigail and Janelle, it looks like you guys are perfect. What happens in the process of transcription? Good, so transcription takes DNA and makes a strand of mRNA. Still a lot of movement at the top. Good job, Sayana. I gotta always put emphasis on your name now so I don't get it wrong. What happens in the process of translation? Yeah, we go from mRNA to a protein. Melissa made a big jump. The grouping of three bases on the mRNA are blank, and the three on the tRNA that match are called blank. The grouping of three bases, we call it the blank chart. Okay, I uh, struggled with this one a little bit. A lot of us said the red one. Yeah, so the grouping of three bases on mRNA, those are called codons. On the tRNA, there's a small part at the very bottom of the tRNA that's called the anticodon, and it matches with the codon. So it's something we'll have to revisit. Okay, so it seems like the three people who got it right were, at the, were outside of the top five. Which of the following get chained together using peptide bonds to make a protein? Excellent. Yeah, so amino acids are, of course, the monomers that make up proteins, and they're bounded by peptide bonds. Good job, Ashanti. Nice jump there. <clears throat> what is the central dogma of biology? Good, the central dogma is that DNA 
gets transcribed to RNA, which is then translated into amino acids, which become proteins. Good job, Sally, and Janelle, and Melissa. Two questions left. Let's see if anyone can catch Abigail. What is the complementary strand of DNA for the following gene? Be careful, it says the complementary strand of DNA, DNA. Good, excellent. Okay, nine out of the 14 answers. Nine out of the 13 answers, I'm sorry, I can't do math. Uh, we're correct, so that's, that's, a good, that's a good percentage rate. So it's DNA. So all we needed to look at was the very first nucleotide. A is going to be complementary to T. T is the, the, only, and the, the only, only the correct answer had T as the very first base. So uh, we only needed to look at that one. Good job, Lance. Last question. Translate the following mRNA codon into an amino acid. Sorry that the picture is cut off a little bit. So AUC, which amino acid does that get you? Good. All right. This specific codon chart made it pretty easy to see because it literally says AUC right here. That gives you ILE. Um, but of course, if we didn't have AUC, we should still be able to figure it out because A is the third row, U is the first column, and then C would tell you that it was ILE. Next. Let's see what the results were. Excellent. Everybody in the top three got seven out of 10. That's what I love to see. Excellent job, Abigail. And uh, all of you, I really liked where we are today. So we're gonna keep going. Let's jump back into the notes. How much time do we have? 32 minutes. Yeah. Okay. So again, at the very least, I do recommend that you write down the highlighted phrases, sentences, and words. So before we go any further, we've got to remind ourselves what a gene is. We talked about genes way back when, I think during our chat or our unit on the cell cycle. But a gene is simply a small section of DNA that codes for a specific protein. So I like to think about it like this. If there is an entire book of DNA, a gene would just be one chapter, or it might even just be one sentence. So in our DNA, we've got, like I've told you in the past, about 3 billion base pairs. So 3 billion A, T, C, A, T, T, A, G, C, A, blah, blah, blah. But in that large book of DNA, there would only be 30,000 genes. Each gene is going to make, on average, about three proteins. You might be wondering, how can a gene make multiple proteins? That's a little bit more complicated, and we, we won't talk about that in this class. But we will talk about another vital process. 
That process is called gene regulation. Gene regulation refers to the process of activating, meaning turning on, and deactivating, meaning turning off, certain genes. It really is, in many ways, very similar to just flipping a switch. We won't get into the actual biochemistry of this process, but gene activation or gene regulation is just a matter of turning on some genes and turning off others. The important thing to remember is that Every cell in your body has the entire copy of DNA. There are not different amounts of DNA in different cells. There are not different types of DNA in different cells. Every cell in your body has the exact same copy and it's the whole copy of DNA. The difference arises from the fact that these cells have differently activated genes. So the cells that make up your neurons in your nervous system have certain genes activated that allow them to carry chemical charges. The genes that make up your muscle cells that surround your heart have certain genes activated that also allow them to carry chemical charges, but also to constrict in order to, to pump the heart. So there are similarities in, in, in all cells, but there are really unique differences that allow them to have different jobs. This process is ensured by the fact that gene regulation controls what proteins are produced in each cell. So if you turn on a gene, that gene is going to start to produce a protein because of the process of that gene is going to be transcribed, and then that gene will be tr translated, and it's producing a protein because of what we've talked about over the last couple of lessons. You turn off that gene, then the process of transcription never happens, and so no protein is made. Different cells have different genes activated, and therefore they have they make different proteins. This process is controlled by both electrical and chemical signals. So your cells are always communicating with one another saying, okay, you need to produce more of this protein or the body has just taken in this substance. So you need to produce this protein in order to balance it out. Or, okay, there's too much of this protein going around. So I need you to actually make another protein to help break that one down. So this is a really complicated process, but the cells communicate with one another by sending electrical signals in the format of chemicals, ions, sodium, potassium, calcium, what we might refer to now as electrolytes in some cases, and then also chemical signals like hormones, your endorphins, 
uh, your oxy uh, tocin, your adrenaline, these are hormones that allow your cells to communicate. Okay, the one important thing to keep in mind in this process, we're putting a lot of emphasis here on the genes and for good reasons. The genes do ultimately have profound impacts on the proteins that our cells produce. But the other, the other half of that is the interaction between your genes and your environment. In a biological context, when people talk about the environment, they're not just talking about being outside and. Um, getting exposed to sunlight and being exposed to good oxygen levels. They're also just talking about what you're exposed to more generally in terms of the food that you eat, in terms of the amount of activity, physical activity you're getting every day, in terms of the amount of human interaction you're gaining every day. These things also have an impact on the proteins that your cells produce. In reality, it's at any given time almost impossible to say whether or not the genes or the environment has had a greater impact on making a person who they are. This is a central question in several different fields of science. Is it nature or is it nurture? Were people born that way or were they made to be that way because of their environment? Even those of you who might be interested in criminology, this is a central question in criminology, the study of crime, the study of criminals. Were criminals born bad people or did their circumstances and situations force them to do bad things? It's the same question we might ask in psychology. Were certain people born more likely to develop depression or did their circumstances lead them to that? In reality, in most situations, it's a little bit of both. Another good example, for those of you who might be interested in track, maybe you run track or maybe you just jog uh, as a form of exercise, there is a very small tribe in Kenya. Tribe is less, fewer than 10,000 people and Kenya is an African country. And this very small tribe of Kenyans has produced some of the greatest long distance runners in the history of the world. Uh, these people go across the, go across the world and, and win races in Tokyo, London, Chicago, New York, Boston. Um, and they've been some of the most successful Olympic runners as well. And this is being done without any real, for the most part, any real traditional training and without many of the resources that um, an American or a European athlete might have. So researchers became interested. Why is this? Why is this very small group of people so good at long distance running? Um, and they studied their bodies, and what they found was that uh, this African tribe, even the people who weren't runners, their bodies were really, really good at carrying oxygen in their blood. Um, they were really efficient at doing that. What this means is that when you're engaged in long term exercise, as we've talked about in this class you can do aerobic respiration a lot better. Your body is creating more energy. And as a result, you're not relying on that anaerobic process, which leads to cramps and which is just in general, a lot less efficient. So over the course of a two hour race, you know, when you're running 26.2 miles, that leads to a big difference in performance. 
So then the question became, well, why is it just this special group of people? So the scientists started to study their environment. What they found was that this Kenyan tribe historically had lived in a very high altitude place. And that high altitude place meant that they were exposed to very thin air where there wasn't very much oxygen. Um, and this meant that this meant essentially that their bodies had to evolve to be better to be better at keeping and carrying that oxygen over time. So we see that interplay between the environment and the genes. And 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 now, after you know, following those research studies, athletes all over the world will choose to train in high altitude environments to prepare their bodies um, for competition to give their bodies the better chance at carrying oxygen more efficiently. Um, another way that scientists have studied the impact of genes and environments is through twin studies. Um, I don't remember if any of you are twins, but I am a twin. I'm not an identical twin. I have a fraternal twin sister. Uh, but scientists often study identical twins because those people have, for all intents and purposes, the exact same genes. Obviously, there might be some mutations that make them slightly different, but they are basically genetically identical. Um, and so, we can see if these people have the exact same genes, then all of their differences should be accounted for by their environment rather than by their genes. So we can see if one identical twin eats really well and does not actually become obese, whereas another twin eats not very well and does develop obesity, then that's likely a result of their diet. Um, they have the same genes that might lead them to have the same metabolism, to have the same preference, for foods, but because of the differences in their actual diets, it led to a different outcome. Um, so these are very common research studies, again, that take place in, in different fields of science. But what we know is that this question of nature versus nurture, whether it's being applied in criminology, psychology, biology, uh, anatomy, what we will find is that there's always going to be some effect from both. All right. That leads me into another discussion. You won't need to take notes on this. So, so March, as I've talked about, is National Women's History Month. When I first taught this lesson last semester, it took place in October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Of course, women are not the only people who can get breast cancer. People who are born biologically male can also get breast cancer as well, um, but of course, people who are born biologically female are far more likely to get it. But I want you all to think about this concept that I'm talking about, um, the interplay between genes and environments. And then answer this question, how might a person's likelihood of developing breast cancer be affected by both their genes and their environment? Any thoughts about that? Okay, so if you have a parent who had breast cancer, that definitely has an effect on your likelihood of developing breast cancer. Thank you, Sally. And that, that would be considered genetic. What else, what else might be a risk factor? Are we aware of any others? Yeah, diet, there are some foods, uh, not, well, not necessarily specific foods that if you eat it once, then now all of a sudden you're more likely to get breast cancer, but um, just diet in general, if your diet is consistently and frequently not nutritious or it has a lot of different uh, processed foods in it, then that can also increase your likelihood of developing breast cancer. Anything else we want to mention? Um, no, I think how a person can also get breast cancer is like maybe, um, um how can I say, past family members, say like maybe the other member had um, breast cancer and had passed down to them. Good. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't always have to be a family member. If 
this is why doctors will oftentimes ask you not only about your parents, but also maybe your grandparents or your aunts. Um, that can also be an indication that there may be a specific mutation in your genes uh, that goes with the environment because, yeah, and Sally is right that the, the food would be considered an environmental uh, risk factor as well. And we, I think you're right, Sully, we do need to acknowledge that socioeconomics come into play here. Not everyone can necessarily afford um, healthier foods, but more, if we think about it from a higher up level, not everyone has access, even if they might be able to afford it, even if they might want it, they might not have access to it. There might not be a fresh produce market, you know, uh, within walking distance or, you know, that is close enough for you to reasonably get there on a regular basis. So um, that's something we have to acknowledge as well, that the environments and also the social, the socioeconomic context also plays a role. So thank you for that. Specifically, there are two genes that have been shown to impact a person's likelihood of developing breast cancer. We refer to these genes as BRCA genes, B-R-C-A, and that of course stands for breast cancer. Uh, these genes appear on two different chromosomes. So how many chromosomes do humans have? How many pairs of chromosomes? 23, 23, very close. Uh, we've got 48 total chromosomes and the those are, well, no, 46 total chromosomes. And those are, uh, there are 23 pairs. So, I'm losing my okay, so only on two of these chromosomes do we find these BRCA genes, uh, chromosome 17 and chromosome 13. If a person has a mutated BRCA1 gene, it means that they have up to a 65% chance of developing breast cancer by age 70. That's very, very high. That means it's more likely than not that they will. Uh, and with the BRCA2 mutation, excuse me, the chances are as high as 45%, also quite high. That means that it's basically 50-50. We'll just kind of have to wait and see. So what this means is that some women uh, recently have actually chosen to preemptively get mastectomies. When they, know, when they find out that they have one or both of these mutations, they will preemptively choose to remove their breast tissue um, so that they cannot develop breast cancer. The problem or the, the reason they might do that, that is because uh, sometimes breast cancer is difficult to detect. And also, uh, if, if caught too late, it could have spread to other parts of your body where you know more vital organs could be at risk. So um it's a obviously i imagine it would be a very difficult decision to have to go through a surgery uh before you've even developed cancer but it's one that really i think to me illustrates the the difficulty of finding out that you have or might develop breast cancer um so something to be aware of that's the genetic aspect and then as Sally has given us and lisa as well we've got these environmental risk factors as well. So those first two, family history and gene mutation, obviously those are genetic. But then late childbearing, I think that's one that not a lot of people know about um, that can also be a risk factor for breast cancer. Women who choose to have uh, or to try to become pregnant at age of 35 or above are considered geriatric pregnancies. That means that they are considered old to be getting pregnant. Um, and not only does this increase the likelihood of risk for the baby, this also increases the mother's uh, likelihood of developing breast cancer and some other diseases as well. Early menstruation and, and late menopause, obviously those are not choices. Your body will choose that for you. You don't have the opportunity to voluntarily do those things, but uh, those also put a woman, a person who was born biologically female, at greater likelihood of developing breast cancer later on in life. Uh, people who, are, who choose to partake in alcohol, or tobacco, uh, they also are putting themselves at a greater risk of developing breast cancer. And then even prolonged use of oral contraceptives. So that's a fancy way of saying the pill. Uh, the pill is the most uh, popular oral contraceptive. Uh, if you have a history of taking the pill um, to avoid getting pregnant for you know more than 10 years, that can put you at a greater risk for breast cancer as well. So we would consider some of these to be environmental, some of them are genetic, we would consider some of them to be choices. 
um, even if they're good choices. Some women know that they are not ready or not desiring to start a family. They take contraceptives. and we, Nobody's to say if that's a bad thing or not, uh, but it does unfortunately put some people at a higher chance of developing breast cancer. Okay, so a few more slides to take notes on. <clears throat> Gene regulation results in what's called cell specialization. And this is the process by which cells produce specific proteins and therefore develop different structures, which result in different jobs and different abilities. So the proteins that, is, the, the proteins that a cell produces will ultimately determine the job that it's able to do. And this ties back into our conversation about structure determining function. The way something is shaped, and also the things that are inside of it, its components, determine its function. Okay. And we're going to wrap up with a quick conversation about stem cells. So you've probably heard about stem cells before. Stem cells are a relatively recent, well, our ability to use stem cells is a relatively recent scientific development. Stem cells are considered undifferentiated cells. You might even hear them referred to as what are called pluripotent cells because they have so many different abilities. They have multiple potentials. They can do a lot. This is because they haven't yet been assigned a job. They don't have a role yet. They are cells that can eventually become anything. They might develop into muscle cells. They might develop into osteocytes, which are bone cells. They might develop into nerve cells. So more recently, we've been using stem cells um, to treat previously untreatable conditions. People who have lost function in a specific part of their body, we can use try to use stem cells to recover some function. So these stem cells have the ability to develop into specialized cells. Quick question here, what is the process that we are seeing in this image? What process is that? 
we've talked about it before. When one cell is dividing into two cells, Abigail is close, but we're not mitosis. talking. Yes, this would be mitosis. Um, the reason for that is that we can just see exact copies of each cell being made. We're not talking about making any sex cells here. So this is mitosis, identical twin cells. One cell becomes two, two become four, four become eight, so on and so forth. Lastly, uh, cells start off as undifferentiated, but then that process of gene regulation kicks in and the cells become specialized. They start off as undifferentiated stem cells, but then we start to turn on certain genes and turn off others, and it leads to the cells getting a specific job. Okay, so here we can see some of the Carnegie stages. So the earliest days of development, we're only 56 days in there. We can see how this, this, the organism, this, this uh, embryo is developing. What started off as just a collection of stem cells that didn't have a specific job, they start to get specialized through a complex process of cellular communication. Those of you who are interested in potentially becoming nurses or doulas or OBGYN physicians or you know anybody who might be involved in birthing, this is gonna be something you learn a lot about. It's obviously a complex process, but very early on in development is a crucial time because the cells are communicating with one another saying, uh, oh, you're located there? Okay, well, you will eventually become the heart. And you're located a little, a little bit above that, so you'll eventually become the lungs. And you're located a, even more superior to that, more above that. You'll become the heart. You're located posterior to that. So those cells, you're going to become the spine. Uh, and this is a really complex process of cell communication, but it's, it's obviously a remarkable one that leads eventually to uh, what we can recognize as a human fetus. So um, something to consider. Okay, so the essential question, of course, was how do the cells in multicellular organisms perform so many diverse functions? I'm going to go ahead and answer this for you all. Uh, it's because of cell specialization and gene regulation. Certain genes are turned on while others are turned off. Okay. I didn't leave you with enough time for the exit ticket, but don't forget about it. The unit five, day five exit ticket, five quick questions you should go ahead and knock out. Um, tomorrow I am going to introduce a new assignment for the first time. So um, I hope that you all have been using any time you have to kind of catch up and make up missing assignments. I'm going to try to grade today um, to get you all accurate in power school. Thank you all. Good job today, and I will talk to you tomorrow.
Peace out, Janelle. <laughs> Talk to you tomorrow. See you, Jesse.